former prisoner and inmate. <laughs> uh, what are you doing, Guns? Going straight to the sky, let me see you put your hands up. Cause we do till we die, and we on another level. I'm at New York City. Got a piece of the pie. Told you once, told you twice. That we only got one life. Way to achieve success after prison. He's gonna share his story with us right now. Diamond shine, best at night. You wake yours, I'll wear mine. Go dumb tonight. What's up? So I just told a little story about this outlaw biker I was in prison with who painted me this shirt for me. And uh, which had a story behind it, you know, it was a cool OG, not lost were gangsters, but anyways, I'm going to get into the story about my boy Ricky, and I want to tell you about a couple of fights that me and Ricky got in, uh, in some clubs, back when he got out of prison, I was, uh, probably 23 years old, so it was early on, you know, like I said, this, 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 this time frame of me from an age like 20 to 25 was, I was wild as a mother ever, man, and there was a lot of people who didn't even want to be around me because I was wild as a mother ever. Like normal people, like all my friends from high school and kind of regular dudes, and even the guys I hustled with a little bit who sold weed with me. And you know, they're like, hey, go out with the hell, man. You're probably going to end up in a fight. You may end up in jail. It's just, you know, it's just bad news. So they didn't call me very often, you know what I'm saying? They call once in a while. Same with my cousins, you know, the Silver Spoon uh, mafioso cousins of mine who who were, you know, raised in that environment. Silver Spoons had daddy's name. People knew who they were because of their name. They didn't have to do gangster stuff. They wore shoot and tie in the club and acted like mobsters, you know, which was fine. But I didn't have that. I didn't have the last name. And all I had was these and a bad attitude because I felt like I had something to prove. And I was always trying to prove myself to them and everybody else. So when I act wild, knock a mother effer out for them or do something crazy, they're all like laughing and patting me on the back. Like, yeah, that's funny. Yeah, that's crazy mother effer, bro. But and sometimes they call me for backup and I've gotten into that a bunch of times where they, you know, hey, let's hit the club. And I, when they say, hey, let's hit the club, nine times out of 10, it's because they had some beef with somebody in the club they knew they were going to run into over a girl or something or whatever, money. So, uh, but Ricky, I'm going to go back and tell you about Ricky. <laughs> it's a funny story. So, back when I was living with my dad, when I was 15, 16, 17 years old, I started selling weed, and I was in the weed game, whatever. You know, everybody in the neighborhood knew I was the weed man, and I wasn't a big time, I wasn't a big time, you know. I, was, you know, I maybe sold a pound a week, two pounds a week. You know, I was fronting out quarter pounds with a bunch of dudes, and they were selling it, I've talked about that. But there were these little kids in the neighborhood that were a few years younger than me, man. I didn't really know them, they just kinda knew who I was. And they would come over almost timidly and scared of me because they heard my reputation. I heard I was crazy. I was a gangster. I was this, that, and that. A drug dealer. So they come over and say, hey, man, listen, I got this, this car amp. Are you interested in buying it? And at first I was like, nah. But I started thinking I could sell the stuff. So what I would do is, all right, man, I'll give you an eighth of weed for this car amp or a fuzz buster or a radio or a gun or a gold chain or a TV or whatever, right? And then I, when people would come over to my house all day long, coming and going, because my dad would be at work all day and I'd be home selling dope, they'd come over and I had this pile of like merchandise in my in my uh, my room. And I'll get to how that ended up being a, a full-blown uh, stolen merchandise operation swap scam with freaking uh, my uncle at his pawn shop and these guys in Chicago. It's a crazy story. I'll get to that another day. But I started selling and these people come over. I'd be like, hey, man. You know, they want a bag of weed. I said, it's a bag of weed. And I go, you need a TV? You need an amp? You know, interested in a gun? You're interested in blah, 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 chain, whatever? And they'd be like, oh, yeah. I'm like, how much? I'm like, I tell them. Which would be like triple what I paid for in weed. So they'd be like, I'll take that. Bang. And they grab it. So now I'm like flipping stolen merchandise out of my house. Not a big deal. It wasn't like a big racket or something. But I always had four or five amps and stereos and TVs, a few guns. You know what I mean? Always gold chains. I had a ton of jewelry, man. I had this hook on the back of my door that was just was hanging with gold chains and, and bracelets and crap. It was so much gold and weight hanging from that chain, the hook ended up breaking out of the door. It fell out. 
and I, middle of the night, one night out here, crash, what the frick is that? I look up and the hook had broken out of the door because I had like freaking two pounds of gold hanging on it. And I'd always wear gold and jewelry, but you can't wear it all. And you know, I look like Mr. T or something. So people come by and said, you want to buy this chain? And I, I buy it for pennies on a dollar, man, pennies. I knew I could take it to the pawn shop and sell it for double what I paid for it. So it was, you know, it was a good deal. So Ricky was one of these dudes. He came over and he would bring me stolen merchandise, right? And I always kind of looked down at thieves, you know, I was not like a, I did not a thief. I was not into thieves, although I hung around some thieves, um, but I really didn't even like them either. I thought they were scumbags, you know, anyone who's gonna break into a house and steal or just, just steal was a scumbag to me. But, you know, I was, I was a drug dealer. I mean, I didn't have a lot of options in terms of who I hang around with or whatever. I, like, <laughs> I mean, who am I to judge? I'm, I'm a drug dealer and I sell the stolen merch. So he would come by. I didn't really know to do. I didn't even know his name was Frederick for years. But they called him Rick. Rick. Kind of a good-looking kid, not too bad. He hung around a couple of other freaking, you know, bad apples. They'd come over with some stolen stuff. I'd buy it for pennies on a dollar, send him on the way. He lived like a block or two away from me, so he told me. He hung around another dude uh, named Cena, who, uh, who actually, whose brother was a connected mob guy. Um, but he ended up in prison before I got to know him. So, Ricky would come over and send me stuff, whatever. And that's that's all I, all I got out of the freaking dude, right? And then he disappears for like four years. And I think I heard he went to prison. I'm like, I think somebody said, you don't have your kid Ricky Schmierheim, he went to prison. I'm like, oh damn, that sucks, you know? Guys are going to prison all the time. Fat George is in out of prison. A lot of guys are going to prison. And, uh, and then that's that. And then one day, I get arrested for a pistol. I get caught with a pistol. A stupid story, and I'll tell it really quickly. We had an uh, a credit card scam going where I was buying up all this crap and then returning it for cash. But I had done it so much that I didn't want to do it myself, so I sent my boy, Mark, who's a straight shooter, but he said he'd do it for me. He's a straight shooter, so I sent him in there to, you know, to return like this, something that I bought, like a big, like expensive tool that was like 600 bucks or whatever. I probably said, I'll kick you $100 or something. He's like, yeah, I'll do it. So he goes into the mall, Eastland Mall, or not Eastland Mall, uh, Macomb Mall, and I'm a Sonic and Gratiot. And I'm sitting in the car, playing with my pistol. I got a 44 Desert Eagle. It's a big, giant, automatic cannon, bro. It's just like, you know, semi-automatic, but it's a big, big old mother effort. Huge. I just bought it. And I'm playing with it, and I'm like cocking it and loading it. Just because I got nothing to do. I'm waiting for him to come out. He comes out with the money. He gets in the car, and I go to pull out, and cops just come swarming up everywhere. But they lock me in, get out of the car. I'm like, what the frick is happening, man? I'm thinking we're busted for the freaking, for the scam. And, you know, get out of the car, put the gun, where's the gun, where's the gun, how's the gun, I don't know, it's on the floor. Anyways, somebody had seen me playing with the gun. This is why you don't smoke dope and do drugs, because I'm sure I was high as hell, and just not paying attention, and somebody must have walked by and saw me. I don't remember seeing anybody. They'd have to be pretty close to be able to look at my car, see me carrying this gun, playing this gun. I didn't see anyone, but somebody did. They called the cops. Now, the irony of this is, one of the cops, the main cop who's on top of his car, going, get out of the car. I know him. It's my friend Jeff Miller's dad. And I know him. I know Jeff. I, I, I know him personally. I've been to his house a bunch of times. His dad would say to me, are you selling steroids to my son? I'd be like, no. You know, and he'd be like, don't bullshit me, man. I know why you're here. It was funny. But he was cool. Cool cop. And I go, Mr. Miller, it's me, it's Mr. Miller. I'm just friend. He's like, oh, oh what's up, man? What are you, what's happening, man? We got a report, you got a gun in the car. Said, yeah, I got a gun. You know what I'm saying? So, thanks to him, they didn't charge me with a felony firearm. It was a stolen 44 Desert Eagle, right? And I'm a felon in possession of it. Now, this is typically a mandatory two year sentence minimum. That's it, two years. They don't even do nothing. They just say, we'll shove you through the system and see it in two years. It'll be out in two years. But thanks to him, he's like, I'm going to work with you, help work them. And they ended up charging me with, I bonded out right away. I've got Ray Gonzalez, the bondsman, bonded me out. It was only like 700, 800 bucks. And I ended up uh, uh, pleading down to uh, attempted possession of a weapon, undisclosed. So they didn't even say what the weapon was. It could have been a butter knife, you know what I'm saying? And they gave me two weeks in the county jail. 
So I was like, man, happy as hell. Man. It sucks two weeks in the county jail. But one of the things that it was good was, this is a point in my life where I was getting high. I was on drugs, which is the reason I was acting so wild. Typically, I wouldn't do wild shit like this, you know what I'm saying? I wouldn't be so stupid, but, but I was. But it was just starting, like, drugs. I was young. I, you know, I, I probably was on pain pills for a couple of months, you know, so I've been taking pain pills every day, you know, Vicodins every day. So I was kind of strung out on Vicodins. But uh, so when I went to the county jail, it cleaned me up. It was like almost like a rehab. It was a good thing. So I remember the day I go to the county jail. I come walking in. You know, they they book you in and book in and they put you in a jumpsuit and they give you a, like a plastic box, a bedroll, you know, box for your property and your, uh, your commissary, whatever. So I come walking in my unit. I think it was on 1011, like C unit. And it's just like any other county jail. There's freaking guys all over. There's table gambling there, table gambling there. There's a TV table, guys want TV. Everybody's yelling, it's loud as hell. There's people everywhere. And uh, I come walking in and uh, I go. I just happened to get a, a lucked up and got a single man cell, which there's not that many of them. I, this happened to me a few times, a single man cell. But I got one, I was happy, man. I got like the best one. So I walk in there and I set my box down. I'm like, oh, the effort, man. Two weeks in this month, this is gonna suck. Plus some kicking dope. Plus, I'm kicking dope, so I'm, like, going to feel like shit. I look out of the cell, and there's this big white dude stare, staring at me from the card table. It's him and, like, five black dudes. He's standing. The rest of them are sitting at the table. So I took it as he's running a dice game or a, a poker game or something. But he's staring at me hard. So I kind of glance away, like, eh, nah, nah. I was trying to start a beef with my first day here. Some big white dude. He just keeps staring at me. He's smiling. He goes, dude, Al, what's up? He comes walking towards myself. He's Ricky. I'm like, damn, bro, what the frick? You got big as hell. Like I said, the last time I saw him, he was like 15, 16 year old little skinny kid. But then he had gone to prison for four and a half years and worked out and ate good and buffed up and became a man and got all these tattoos on him. So now he's like this big buff tattooed up prison guy, right? And he comes over and gives me a hug. He's like, Mother Effer, I knew that was you, man. I was telling the guys at the table, I'm like, that's a real OG right there. He's like, I'm telling these guys, that's a freaking OG right there. And you know, I'm like, he's like, what's happening? So I tell him why I'm there. And he goes, Dad, I said, what are you doing here? He's like, eh, I'm going back to prison. He's like, I got out. I was on uh, Tether. I was living with my grandmother. And I got busted selling weed and steroids. I mean, uh, acid. He got busted selling. I'm like, dude, you're on tether living with your grandmother and you're selling acid and weed out of her. I mean, how much did you get busted for? He's like, oh, I got a sheet and a freaking quarter ounce or something. I'm like, you freaking idiot, bro. He's like, I know, bro, idiot. So over the next two weeks, I hang out with this mother effer every day. And it's funny as hell because I finally got to know him. I didn't know him before. I just knew him as his Steve from the neighborhood, right? But now I actually got to know the kid and he was really funny, really funny and really witty and like a charming dude he's super funny man and he had all these freaking black dudes in there convinced that he was a killer like they they thought he was a freaking straight og killer because he had done time in prison you know most of the guys in there doing county time they never been to prison a few guys were but he pretended like he was this hardcore prison guy killer you know and they were all on his dick and they were afraid of him they were scared i thought it was hilarious because i'm like this dude kid's a freaking punk man he's just a freaking little pussy from the neighborhood really i'll slap the shit out of this dude and he knows that so he didn't even say he's like i got these guys freaking think i'm a killer man he'd laugh I'm like, man, that's funny. But I thought it was funny how we did that. And so for two weeks, I get to know the kid. And I get to, basically, every day we were running card games and poker games and dice games and hanging out. And he was just a fun kid to hang out with. So it made my time go. He's like, I got, I'm going back to prison for another, like, three or four years. God, that sucks. So by the time I left in two weeks, I had one more warrant that I had to go to. So when they let me out in two weeks, I had a warrant for another thing in Harper Woods. But it got dismissed. First, I had to bond out. But it was on uh, the day of the Super Bowl. The Super Bowl was that day. So I went and I came, my girl picked me up, bonded me out from that case. I went straight to the gym, worked out, sat in the jacuzzi, and then went to a Super Bowl party at Fat George's house. But um, I told, before I left, I told Ricky, I said, hey, man, I like you, bro. You're a funny mother effer. You're my friend, and you'll always be my friend. And I was, I meant it. That's how I am. Like, if I make friends with you, dude, that's it. I'm for life. I'll never do you wrong. I'll never screw you over. I'll never, you know, I'm for real a friend, man. And not everybody's like that. Very, very few people are like that. I, I don't get that, but it's just, I was raised differently. I guess that's just the kind of guy I am. 
he wasn't like that, and most people weren't. But um, but I said, hey man, listen, here's my girl's number. Call her once or about once a month, and she'll freeway me, and and I'll send you a couple of bucks, and we'll stay in contact. So so when you get out, you know, I'll help you get on your feet. And he's super happy, and he hugged me, and I left, and whatever. So for the next like three four years, this dude calls my girl. This is back when calls were like fifteen dollars a call. So. And I didn't live with my girl, so my girl would, he would call my girl, who would have to pay the collect call, her, her stepmother would make her pay for them because they were expensive, um, and she didn't like that. And then she'd three-way me, put me on the phone with him, and I'm like, what's up, boo, you know, how you doing, blah, 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 and we'd talk for 15 minutes, and then i hang up the phone, and i tell my girl, send him some money. She's like, I'm not sending him some money, you send him some money. I'm like, I don't know how to send him some money, send him some money. You sent me money in jail, send him 30 bucks. So she would, she always did. She always sent him money, 25, 30, 40 bucks, you know, and she, she, she hooked him up. And this is for four years, which pisses me off later down in the road when he, when I was in prison, that mother ever never sent me a letter or a dime. You know? and, but drugs are, drugs are a hell of a thing, man. They, they had this control of his mind. So and I guess I never knew he was into drugs like that. Like I didn't know. I never saw that part of him. And I'll tell you what, what happened next is, um, so Around this time, I had moved back from New York. I went on the run for a couple of years, or you know, whatever, how long it was, a year and a half, two years, I can't even remember. And then I came back, and my girl got me uh, an apartment, nice apartment, and um, hooked it all up. And I, it was in her name. So one day, I'm sitting there in my house, my apartment, just chilling, you know. Back, you know, what I'm doing is back to selling weed and steroids and stuff and hustling. Same thing, stolen merchandise, anything to make a buck. Anything so I don't have to work a real job because I'm a lazy bum and a loser. You know, I just didn't, didn't, I couldn't work a real job. I tried, I couldn't do it. I was a freaking idiot. So I've been living there for a couple of months and one day I get a knock on the door. And I hadn't heard from Ricky in a while, been a few months. Um, I forgot about the kid. And all of a sudden, I get a knock on the door. Click, click, click. And who the fuck is at my house? I open the door. It's Ricky. He's standing there in a pink Oxford polo shirt and, like, khaki pants. The same nerdy-ass shit that we were wearing in high school, you know, seven, eight years ago. You know what I'm saying? Whatever it was, six, seven years ago. He's basically dressed like we dressed in high school, you know? Saying, I, I looked at him, opened the door. I go, dude, what's up? It's like, I'm out. I'm like, cool, cool. How'd you find me? He's like, I called Ramona. And she gave me the address. And I just figured I'd come here and surprise you. I'm like, cool, dude, come in. And I said, but first things first, bro. Like, I can't be seen in public with you like that, bro. Like, what? He's like, what do you mean? I said, go up in my closet. And, um, grab some Nautica jeans. Grab a couple pairs. I had a hookup on stolen Nautica jeans. And stolen any kind of clothes. You know, this black dude I was, work, uh, I was uh, messing with, working with, he had a full-blown clothing scam where he had crackheads going into stealing clothes from Marshall Fields and Hudson's and all that and then he, would, he had like a store in his basement and you could go down there and buy $100 jeans for $25 so I'd go in there you know every couple weeks and drop 100 bucks buy a few jeans a few shirts a jersey whatever um, so I said go up in my closet I just got like five new pair of jeans I said grab a couple of pair of jeans they'll fit you we're about the same size I said but don't grab the black ones because I only had one pair of black nautica jeans and I like them I don't take them and then I said I, I go in my closet and I dig it around I got a bunch of football jerseys and stuff I'm like here man take one of these man and you know look like a look like a nerd dude I said come on let's go shopping he's like what you serious I said yeah man I'm gonna get you some clothes you need some new shoes man we we'll get some, some, some gear so he's super happy and excited he's like Oh, hell yeah, man. And I didn't have a ton of money. I mean, I wasn't loaded. You know, if I dropped 500 bucks on a dude. Uh, it wasn't like I was balling. And 500 bucks is 500 bucks. But uh, I still wasn't going to, you know, I wanted to welcome home. So I dropped I dropped 500 on him. And, uh, and he uh, was super happy. I got him some clothes and some gear. I think freaking, where's my, I think I'm in the wrong freaking place, yo. I got to, I got to. I gotta find this doctor's office, you guys. I'll be back. All right, I'm back. I uh, got some injections in the back of my neck. Never had them before. A couple, like four shots deep in there. And maybe it has the numb the, the nerve that's causing some of these headaches in the back of my head. We shall see. So back to Ricky. Uh, so Ricky comes, gets out of prison, and he comes to see me and take him shopping and. And it's kind of a, it's a funny scenario because the dude's like, 
I'm like 24 years old at the time, and I had been clubbing and wilding out since I was 17 years old, up in clubs, you know, just tearing up clubs. He heard all these stories about me in the clubs, fighting, knocking my efforts out, wilding out. Oh, he heard it all. I'm sure heard it from guys in the neighborhood, guys in the prison, guy, and he's never even been to a club because he got locked up when he was like 17, went away for four or four and a half years, got out was only out a couple of months and then went away again for like another three years. So the dude's never been in a nightclub or nothing. And I'm just like, I'm mind blown by that. Cause you know, when he went away, he wasn't up in nightclubs and partying and you know, getting it in. So I'm like, dude, I gotta take you to the club. There's a hot new club that just opened called City Rhythms. I said, you know, we're gonna go up in there and freaking ball out. And he's like, all right, cool. So he's super excited. He said, so pick me up, you drive. So his dad gave him this little white truck. It's a little white pickup truck, you know. But, you know, it was a car. And so he picks me up, and the club is only about two miles from my apartment. I lived in a place called, I can't remember the name of the apartments, but it was known as, called Sin City. They were just kind of projects. They like they like little condos, you know, the project kind. Of, they, it was actually a pretty nice place. They had upstairs on the main floor, was, you know, one bedroom and, that's all I needed, you know. My my girlfriend had hooked it up, so I was perfectly happy to have that place. There wasn't like a lot of drugs and crime in there. I mean, there's just a lot of low class people living in there, you know. But probably a ton of weed pumping pump through there or whatever. I remember hating that place because they wouldn't let me keep my motorcycle there. I had a ninja, and they wouldn't let me keep it there, so I had to keep it at my boy's house. But anyways, so he comes pick me up. We go to the club, the city rhythms, right? Big club. The the, the parking lot is is so packed when we pull up. That we can't even find a place to park, so we end up parking across the street on Grosbeck. It's right on Grosbeck Avenue, like 15 and a half on Grosbeck, right next to the gym where I worked out. And uh, I knew some of the bouncers in there and from the gym. Now, this place is open like two weeks ago, so it's actually banging, right? My boy Bobby Leon, I believe, was the DJ. The place is pumping. There's a line out the freaking door, but I know the bouncers and I know the manager, I know the bartenders and everything, so. Ricky is just like, oh my God, this is crazy. He's like, never seen nothing like it. This big banging, bumping club, music pumping, people coming and going. So I basically walk right through the line, right to the front. I know the bouncer. I'm like, what's up, man? And uh, they're like, hey, what's up, Al? And I walk, shake your hand. I walk in, and me and my boy. I think I even said, my boy just got a prison, man. He ain't never been to a nightclub, so we're gonna have some fun. So I walk up to the, go through the thing. And I remember, as soon as I hit the club, as soon as I hit inside, because there's like a breezeway, that's a pretty big breezeway, and then you walk into the main club and just pump it, boom, boom, and there's freaking people everywhere, there's a dance floor pumping. And the DJ, Bobby, sees me through the crowd. He goes, I hear him go, What's up, my boy Big Al in the house? Boop, boop. And then he plays my song, Keep the Heads Ringing, boom, ding, dong. But, anyways, I walk straight up to the bar, and because I knew that, dude, that DJ from, I bounced at another nightclub where he worked and, and the, the the bartender who was there his name was Pat Heck he was a freaking world champion bartending uh, dude he literally won the world champion but I've talked about this guy before he actually let me stay in his house there's a couple other stories that kind of build off of this dude because he let me stay at his house and when I was staying there I robbed the dude of 25 pounds of weed and like ran with a, with a duffel bag of weed through the backyards and stuff it was funny but he was mad cool he 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 was the world champion bartender. I mean, literally the world. He flips the bottles and he does like these shows. He flips the bottles and he catches them behind his back, you know, pouring and stuff. It's just crazy, the stuff that he does. It's crazy. Like he practices all day. He has bottles wrapped in tape, so if he drops them, they don't break and he flips bottles all day. And I remember when he went to Miami, he went to Miami, he said, I'm going to Miami for the freaking the national title of bottle flipping or bottle bartending national title. If I win it, I go to Amsterdam. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, whatever. I don't care. He ain't gonna freaking win. Boom comes back. He's like, he won. He won like five grand and the Jägermeister, the 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 drink, Jägermeister, the liquor, the sponsoring to take him, uh, pay for him to go to Amsterdam. Him and one other person to pay for Amsterdam. He says to me, Al, I want to take you to Amsterdam. And I'm like, me? Why me? He's like, I'm like, eh, you know. He's like, yeah, bro, I want you to come with me, man. We'll go to. I'm like, I mean, dude, you probably should take your girl or something. You know what I'm saying? And, 
I'm not even that close to the guy, you know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm living at his house, but I'm not, we're not like super boys or whatever. I'm like, why don't you take your girlfriend? And I said that. I said, I'm thinking about passports and crap. I'm like, ah, oh, man, you should probably just take your girl, bro. He's like, all right, man, but so, I mean, if you want to go, man, me and you, I'm going to win this mother effort. And he did, and he went, and he won 50,000 bucks. Unbelievable. He was the world champion bartender. So now on this night, I come in, probably a year or two later, a couple years later, I walk in with Ricky and I walk up to the bar and it's crowded, people everywhere, it's packed, whatever. And Pat sees me and he's like, what's up, man? And slaps my hand. And he's like, man, what you doing, man? You, you drinking? Because I usually don't drink, you know? I said, yeah, bro. He's like, well, what are you drinking? I said, we're celebrating. My boy just got out of prison, man. Just did four years in prison. He's like, oh, hell yeah. Welcome home, bro. He's like, you know, what are you drinking? I'm like, I don't know. I don't know what to drink. I don't drink. So I said, Give me something that's kind of fruity and strong. I can handle fruity, you know what I'm saying? He goes, I got something for you. And I'm like, what is it? He's like, Pitbull on crack. That's the name of the drink. I said, the name of the drink's called Pitbull on crack? He's like, yup, it's my own personal drink, Pitbull on crack. So I was like, all right, pour it up. So there's like big glass, he pours four or five of them. I said, give me a bunch of them because I'm gonna pass them out to these ladies, these girls over here. And, and he pours off four or five of them. And it, and they're like, they're tall and they're red with like four or five shots of liquor in them, something like Long Island kind of. And I look over at these girls at the bar next to us. I'm like, what's up, girls? And I said, like, you want a drink? And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah. I'm handing them a drink. And they're kind of looking at them. They're like, what's up with you? I said, listen, my boy just got out of prison. I, and this is what I said, my literally exact. <laughs> it's so bad, dude. It's so bad. I said, my boy just got out of prison. Between the two of us, we got at least 12 inches of prison yard cock. <laughs> I don't know why I'd never even been to prison. I'm like, we got at least 12 inches of 12, uh, prison yard cock. And they're laughing, ha, ha, ha. And it was what, the one girl was kind of like an alternative chick, you know what I'm saying? She, you know, dressed a little bit different and alternative, dark makeup, and blah, blah, blah. She was cute, though. And Ricky ended up banging her later on, but not that night. Um, because he told me a couple weeks later, remember that chick in the bar, you know, the 12 inches of prison yard dick? I'm like, yeah, he's like, yeah, I hit that last night. I'm like, get the frick out of here, you're fine. Yeah, ran into her at another club. He got addicted to the club. Once I introduced him to the clubs, he was, yeah, he was lived in the club. So we drank like one or two drinks over like a half an hour, right? So we're pretty buzzed up for me. You know, like, he's not a drinker, I'm not a drinker. And we're pretty buzzed up. And I remember what I was wearing, and I must have been pretty cold towards the winter time because I had a, a beige sweater on with a wife beater and like khaki, or maybe I had some jeans on. I think I had like just jeans, like nautica jeans with a beige sweater. Underneath I had a wife beater. I don't remember what he was wearing. So he says, let's go dance. And I, I'm like, dude, I don't really like dancing in the club anymore. I used to when I was young. Because you get hot and you're sweating and you're all gross. Now you're trying to mack on some chick and you're like gripping sweat. And you're all clammy underneath. And what happens if you do end up home with a girl that night? You don't want to, you know, be all sweaty and stinky. I was, I'm not a stinky kind of guy. I can sweat and not stink. I'm one of those guys. Very blessed in the regard that when I sweat, I don't really stink. Unless I like really, st if I don't take a shower for a couple days and I sweat then. But now some guys would always say to me after I like, we work out or play basketball. I'm like, dude, you, you, know, you never got PO. I'm like, lucky I guess some people get funky but still it's your subconscious of it so if you get all sweaty dancing and stuff and then after you end up with some girl the first thing you want to do is like yeah I gotta take a shower no, I don't like that so I don't want to dance so he tells me let's go dance so we go dancing right and the song I think it ain't my fault did I do that I don't know if it's juvenile or if it's um one of them dudes you know from the south it ain't my fault did I do that it ain't my that song comes on so we start dancing, and then we kind of start slam dancing. There's a bunch of these dudes that I thought were Arabs, you know, Arab, um, good looking guys, probably six, seven of them. They're kind of dancing, there's girls dancing. But as me and Ricky are worked up, we've got drinks in our hands, we're like banging into people. Man, it ain't my fault, did I do that? Just being douchebags, you know. Ricky started it, and I thought, ah, I'll play along, it's kind of funny. You know, I'll shove a dude, he shoves me a little bit. No big deal, I'm not looking to spite you. But at one point, I kind of bang a dude, and he uh, like shoved me from behind pretty hard. Boom, and I'm like, what the frick? I like, spill my drink. So I'm gonna have a slam, I freaking slam the dude, right? He looks at me like, yeah, okay. As soon as I turn my back, the mother effer like shoves me hard. 
like shoves me hard. Like you're such a bitch. You wait till my back is to you, and then you shove me. You're a punk. I was doing it right, like right to him. I spilled my drink. I turn around, and look at him. I set my drink. Right by this point, most of the girls have left the dance floor. It's just me and Ricky and like five of these Arab dudes, and um, they turn out to be Albanian. But uh, but anyways, I, at the time I thought they're Arabs because there's a lot of Chaldeans in Detroit, Metro Detroit, which are. are um, Iraqi Christians, Christian Iraqi, so they don't really look like uh, Albanians, but you can kind of, they're Mediterranean, dark, you can get confused in the night at dark, in a dark club, you know, um, Albanians do have a look to them, and in hindsight, I, they were, I, they looked Albanian, but, um, so I set my drink down, and I just turned around, and wham, and knocked this dude out, just chin shot, you know, and just turned around, and Ricky sees me, I turned, the thing, I, this dude, who just shoved me hard from behind, I just turned around, wham, he's a tall, thin dude not skinny but tall and thin probably like six foot two 200 pounds you know pr a pretty boy a good looking dude and i just drop him boom he goes right down and as soon as i hit him there were bouncers that were watching us you know what i'm saying they were they were right there watching me and ricky be douchebags so look at how much that jeep is really quick but anyway so it's a jeep for sale market for another new car so the bouncers come over and they're saying they're like hey al man like they know me from the gym i don't know their names but they know me I'm like hey al man listen you know you got to take that shit outside bro you can't just freaking knock them all that far out in the middle of the club man you gotta, you gotta take it outside and i said all right bro i'm just this is a really nice jeep this is gonna be freaking forty thousand bucks probably all right, so I had to stop and look at the Jeep. It's actually a freaking nice Jeep. Got a kind of a lot of miles on it, 183,000 miles. But it's a 2015, 9,500, probably could finagle them down to 8,500. It's a good car. Jeep six cylinder, you know, nice car. Something to think about, I might call them. Um, so anyways, it knocked this mother out and the bouncer say, man, listen, now you gotta take that outside. So I say to him, I'm like, all right, pick him up. I'll finish it, let's go outside. So that was, So I say, come on, let's go outside. So I just start making my way outside and Ricky kind of comes with me and I walk through the breezeway and I walk outside and a couple of bouncers are watching, you know, and I get out, there's like a red carpet with an awning outside. Like the, the entrance of the place has a, like a red carpet that's on a slant that goes up to the door. And there's like an awning, like a red awning over. It's like a nice entrance, you know, and it's about 20 foot long. So I walk outside and I turn around and I like take off my shirt, my sweater, and I got this white beater. And all of a sudden, five or six of these mother effers come piling out. Now I'm nervous. Now two dudes I know, they come out and have my back. A dude named Benny and a dude named uh, Kenny Miller, excuse me. I, I, these three brothers, Jeff, Kenny, and Mike. I just wanted to make sure I get the right one because I just spoke to Mike. Um, and Kenny, I actually wasn't like cool with. I had been cool with him when I was younger. He was a young kid, like a couple years younger than me. And then I, some some stuff with his girl. That I got into beef with his brother over a girl. And then I had like a beef with their whole family for a while. And then later on, I got into beef with Kenny over another girl. And threatened to beat his ass, and his brother called me, and I said, "I beat your ass too." And I don't give a you know. Anyways, nothing ever happened. It's the same dude, the same dude whose father was a cop who I used to go to his house and sell him steroids. Same freaking dude. Um, but now I'm really cool with the guy. Jeff is an amazing dude, and I love him. But at the time, but anyways, Kenny came outside with this dude named Vinny, who I knew, who I grew up with as a kid, and he said, "Yo, El, we got your back, bro." And I said, "I'm calm, cool as can be." I said. I don't need no help. I said, just make sure they don't jump me. They like, get behind me. I said, get behind me. I'll, I'll take these mother efforts. I said, just make sure they don't get me from behind. So Kenny and Vin, they kind of get back there with Ricky. So now I got three people who got my back. They're all standing behind me. And I'm squared off with these five or six dudes. I think it was five. And I'm like this, like, I'm like, what's up? Then? What's up? Who's first? And we're flinching at each other. And they're flinching at me. I go, what's up? I'll smash all you A-Rabs. That's what I said. Just, when you call an Arab an Arab, it's kind of like insulting. I said, man, I'll smash all you Arabs, and I've got a white beater. Now they can see how big I am, because I took my shirt off, and I got a white beater. And so they're like, oh, this is a big muscle-bound mother effort. I said, yeah, what's up? And I just knocked out their boy. 
in, in the club. And uh, there were like some pretty big ones, good sized dudes. None of them were little. Like, well, there was one little guy. And I'm like, what's up? And they're flinching at me. I'm like, what's up, man? What's up, bro? We ain't Arab, man. We Albanian. We Albanian. I said, whatever. That's what I said. I was like, whatever. I'm like, who's first? And like the, the two or three big ones were kind of standing in front of me, and they're like in fight stances, and they're, and they're flinching, like at me. And I'm like, yeah, what's up? Come on, come on, come on. Who's first? What's up? And while I'm doing that, one of the, there was a little guy. I mean, little. I mean, like probably like a five foot six, 150, 60 pound dude, man. He start, he breaks out of the pack and kind of move around to the side. And I don't pay no attention to him because he's a little bum heifer. And I'm thinking he's just really trying to get out of Dodge. I'm thinking he, he's like thinking to himself, I ain't trying to fight that big mother heifer. So I got my boys here. There's four or five of them. They can handle this big mother heifer. So he's off to the side. So I'm like, yeah, what's up? What's up? And all of a sudden, that little mother heifer punches me in the face with brass knuckles. Hits me dead in the bridge of my nose. I actually got lucky. I got lucky. He hit me basically in a perfect spot where he didn't do a ton of damage. The brass knuckles, and I'll tell you how I knew he had brass knuckles in a minute, hit me right on the bridge of the nose and cracked and knocked my nose about literally like a third of an inch over, over in my eye. Now at that point, I went berserk. And it was funny, man. I can't articulate the reaction I had. I can't, you know, I'm driving. But as soon as I, bang, I saw those stars and he hit me. It was a good solid shot. I just said, this is my exact word. I said, you're dead, motherfucker. That's what I said. You're dead, motherfucker. And I freaking, and I ran towards him. And all five of these mother effers turned around and ran and tried to get back in the club. But there were bouncers standing by the door. So they kind of were blocking them. I ran right for the dude who hit me, right? He, he tried to run. And I grabbed him by the back of his shirt and spun him around and hit that mother effer so hard, man. It looked like I lifted him off the ground, man. I'm just like, I go, you dead motherfucker in the ground. Wham, bam, hit him right in the jaw, boom. His head bounces off the wall. He's crumbled on the floor. He's down, right? He's, this is in front of the club, right on the side of like that red carpet. Now, I'm still, I'm mad as a mother effer. I, I, want, I want blood, you know what I'm saying? So I go after these other mother effers and they're all pushing their way back into the club. They actually make it into the breezeway. I go in after them. The bouncers are trying to hold them from getting in the club. I grab one of them and start smashing them, bro. Smashing them. I end up pulling his shirt over his head so it was like a hockey fight. And I'm beating his ass and he's bleeding. So he like rips out of his shirt and jumps over the coat check like there's a girl, there's a girl there behind the counter at the coat check. He jumps over it to get away from me. I jump over. Just imagine how chaotic this is. There's like four other dudes are, are, are trying to get in the club. The bouncers are blocking them from getting in. I'm pounding the dude and the guy jumps over. I jump over and I grab the dude and start beating his ass in the back. The girl's like, oh my God, the dude climbs under the counter. He's trying to get away from me. I'm hiding under the counter and I'm kicking. Come on, motherfucker. Boom, 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 kicking. Bam, bam. Come on, motherfucker. And I hear uh, one of the bouncers like say to her, call the cops. Call 911. So as soon as I hear that, I'm like, uh, it's time to go. Because I'm sure I had warrants. I always had warrants for something. Usually minor stuff, tra traffic violations or minor crimes or investigations or God knows what. Um, so when he said call the cops, I'm like, all right, it's time to go. So I jumped back over the counter. Actually, the first dude that I freaking smashed in the club, or in the breezeway, is stretched out. It was another dude who jumped the counter, and that's the, so now this would have been the third dude I was at. So I knocked the one out up front, first punch. Caught the guy in the breezeway, pounded him, and beat him unconscious too. That's the dude who was all bloody with the shirt over his head. And I went after another one. He jumped over the counter. I get Then they say, call the cops. So I jumped back over and I said, let's go. As I'm walking, kind of fast pacing it out of the club, Ricky had one of these dudes out front. He, was, he had him good. He was whooping his ass. He had him by the shirt like I had him. And he's wailing on him, wailing on him. He's kind of a smaller guy, you know, probably like a 180 pound, you know, five foot 10 dude. But he's putting a, but Ricky was putting hurting on his ass. And the guy kind of rips out of his grip and turns around because he was facing away from me when Ricky's whooping him. 
So he rips out of his grip, turns around the run in the club where he thinks his boys are there to save him, or at least the bouncers, and he turns around to run up that little elevated red carpet that goes into the club, and I come walking out at the same in the same instant. So as he's come, like he's like trying to raise his head, running up. I'm just like I just cock back, and I'm just like, wham, punch him right in the mouth, man. Boom, looks like he's clotheslined. Just cram, boom, flops out. So now he's knocked out. The first dude to hit me is knocked out. There's another one knocked out in the club. And I go to Ricky. And now I'm real calm at this point, man. I tell Kenny and, and Vince, I said, go. I said, Ricky, let's go. It's time to go. Cops. They call the cops. So it's a very busy six-thing highway. We had parked across the street, thankfully. And I can't believe how fast the cops got there. Like, the cops probably were on, on like, first of all, the police station was like a mile away. So there's that. But, um, but they got there. They came from both sides, the cops, like within 30 seconds. Because me and Ricky were standing in the like the, the turning lane trying to get across the road, but there was so much traffic. It was like a Friday or Saturday night, and there was tons of cars blazing down the six-lane highway. We're in the middle of the turning lane trying to wait for traffic to go by. I said, we shoot across the street to where we were parked. And uh, and while we're waiting to get across the street, here come two cops with lights on. Like, and they come in. And I remember looking back in the freaking parking lot and seeing two bodies stretched out. And I know there's one more inside. And I'm like, dude, well, I could be in a lot of freaking trouble if you don't get the fuck out of here. So we ended up shooting across the road. We literally had to run across through traffic to where traffic was like, because we couldn't get across. There's too much traffic. We had to get the frick out of there. So we basically ran in front of a bunch of cars and made them, you know, screech tires. And then we, um, I, he says, you drive. I, I, he says, I, I'm drunk or too drunk. You drive. I'm like, ah, all right. So I get in the car and the first thing I do is like, I look in the mirror. Now there was some light and like I didn't turn a dome light or nothing. There was this light from the ambient light. And I'm, I'm looking in the mirror and my nose was freaking busted and I'm dripping blood. And, and Ricky looks at me and goes, oh damn bro, you got hit. I'm like, yeah, I got hit mother. You didn't see him hit me? He's like, no, I didn't see him. I said, some other, that little freaking guy suckered me from the side. He's like, oh man, I can't believe somebody hit you. That's crazy. But he didn't see how bad it was because it was dark. So I drive a couple of miles to my house and I remember it was funny because there was a Taco Bell like right next to the entrance of uh, to go into my apartment complex. And then there was like a field next to it. And for whatever reason, I was drunk and being funny. I decided to drive through the field and got stuck. <laughs> I didn't get stuck. I just decided. He's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I don't know. Just drive through this field and I get this truck stuck. And we ended up getting it out, whatever. So you get... But it was like kind of scary because it's right on the main highway. If a cop drove by, saw us out in the field. And they're like, what are these idiots doing? So I go to my house and I walk inside. I said, you know, come on upstairs. I'm gonna take a look at my nose. We don't really, I didn't really turn any lights on or nothing. I go up the stairs and I go into the bathroom. And then I flick, like Ricky's standing right next to me as I flick on the bathroom night. And this is Ricky's reaction. I flick on the light and he goes, oh damn, bro. You're freaking fucked up. And I'm looking at my nose. So I'm just like, oh my God, bro. I mean, the bridge of my nose was like over here. It was over here. And he's like, oh my God, bro, what are you gonna do? I'm like, I'm gonna fix it. He's like, what? Dude, you need to go to the hospital, bro. You gotta fix it, how are you gonna fix it? And I'm gonna pop it back. He's like, you can't do it. And I said, and I, and I started doing it. He's going, oh no, dude, oh no, no. And I'm like, snap, popped it right back in place. Snap, maybe that's the source of my headaches all these years later, who knows? Because the, the problem that I have is right here in my sinus. Uh, this is the issue, I have an issue with like a nerve right here. So, you know, who knows? Maybe that was the problem. But I can't believe I popped it right back in place. But as soon as I popped it in place, it started gushing blood. And blood dripping all over the sink and stuff. And uh, I just stuffed some tissue up and then in there. And I said, come on, man. Let's go get last call at freaking Wild Woody. This is another club. He's like, you serious? I'm like, hell yeah, man. Light ain't over, bro. Let's go get last call. Because we're already half drunk. He's like, all right, bet. So... I did leave, there was, when I was going into the house, I had left a little blood on the door and I had a little, left a little blood on the wall, I guess, and then in the bathroom. So my girl had come home from being out. She, you know, she came back to the apartment to wait for me to come home, hopefully if I did come home. And she saw blood and she, she assumed that it was Ricky got his ass whooped. That's what she told me. She's like, she's like, I saw blood. I saw, I thought, oh damn, Ricky must've gotten a fight and got his ass whooped. I'm like, nah, it was my blood. 
So, anyways, uh, so we go to last call at Wild Woody's, right? And I go to walk, I walk in the door, and there's a bouncer there named Gary, head bouncer security at Wild Woody's. I don't know if you could tell I'd been in a fight. My nose didn't look that bad. It just had a, it was a little swollen, and there was like a, a cut, little cut at the bridge of my nose, but it wasn't nothing you really noticed. But something about the way I came in there, he looked, he's like, what's up, Al? He's like, man, he's like, what's up, man? You ain't drinking, are you? I said, yeah, a couple of drinks, man. My boy just got out of prison, man. Um, you know, we're celebrating his coming home. And uh, <laughs> and I said, I was just at the city rhythms and got in a fight and got kicked out. He's like, he's like, Al, you can't be drinking in here, man. And I'm like, oh, man, I'm good, bro. He's like, Al, I know you, man. You can't be drinking in here. So he looks over at the bartender, this chick named Rose, which was funny because she was an Asian girl. And if anybody watched the television show MASH back in the day, there was an Asian bartender named Rose, which was kind of ironic. So everybody kind of thought that was funny. Um, you have to be old to do to remember that. But um, so he looks, he yells, because it was pretty late and a lot of people had already left. You know, it was just like, it was like, there's like 20 minutes left in the night, you know, till the last, last call. And he looks over at Rose. He's like, Rose. And she looks. He's like, what's up, man? There's probably 100, 200 people in the club. And he's like, points to me. He goes, him? No drinking. I said, I freaking said, bullshit, Gary. He's like, I'm just saying, hell, man. I know you. And they, didn't let me, they didn't want me drinking in them clubs. Because if I started drinking in there, dude, I, I was definitely going to cause a problem. Which is an asshole. You know, what a douchebag. You know, just, But that's just who I was, man. I was, I was wild like that. I just wild i'm not sure why just something to prove just always trying to prove myself always trying to i don't know so i walked up to the bar and i say rose let me get two long island iced teas and she's like sorry al i can't serve you gary he's my boss I said I can't serve you i said well he didn't say anything about him so he wants to buy boy ricky he says i said ricky wants two long island iced teas and she's like yeah i, I could serve him he didn't say nothing about him so like, here's a 20 give her for the drinks so she starts asking me what happened because you can see I got in a fight. I'm telling the story. Now my boy Brett, Brett Vermees, he comes walking over. He was a bouncer there. He's one of the bouncers. Big dude. I think he's one of my boys. He loved to hunt and fish. Was never a tough guy. Not a tough guy at all. But he looked tough. He was a big muscle bound mother ever. Huge. Tall. But he wasn't no freaking tough guy at all. It was just all in front. But um, which is fine. Not everybody's you know supposed to be a tough guy. But he comes walking over and he's like, he's like. So what happened? And I'm telling the story what, what me and Ricky just did back in City Rhythms. How I grabbed this freaking dude, bang, and I knocked him out and chased him. I'm going through the whole motion, telling him the whole story, you know, real animated. And as I'm telling the story, the, the girl and, and, and Brett are, are going, they're going, oh, Al, Al, man, come on, man. I'm like, what, what? You're getting blood all over the place. And I look down on the, on the bar, and there's blood all over the place. And he's, they're giving me napkins and stuff. And Ricky's over there laughing. He's drinking his drink. <laughs> it's hilarious, you know what I'm saying? And so I stuffed some tissue up in my nose and uh, <laughs> and then uh, until I finished telling the story. And that's how I ended the night with, uh, with Ricky. Um, but it really wasn't over. I'll tell another fight story about Ricky on another video. It's funny. It was literally the very next week when we got in another fight at a club called Lagos. And uh, which was fun. We took the boat there and freaking were acting wild. And, I have I, I just I don't want to ruin the story. I'll tell it another day, but it'll be a short one, just a short like 10, 15 minute video about about Ricky. But one of the sad things about Ricky was um, he started getting high. As soon as he started getting high. So so I put Ricky in the game, by the way. So I I, I fronted him weed, pounds of weed, and dope, whatever it was he could get rid of. I I got him a good job. Got him a good job, dude, making like 25 bucks an hour. This is a long time ago, man. This is 1995 or something like that. 25 bucks an hour is pretty good for an ex con who just got out of jail. Plus, I'm fronting him weed. He's doing really good. And I told him, man, listen, as long as you stay straight and narrow, stay off drugs, you know, act right, you know, we'll always be boys. You know, you'll always be part of my crew. And he was, man. The dude would do anything. He would freaking kick in a door and rob a mother effer in a minute. I can't tell you how many times where I said, listen, dude, I know what's in this house, you know, whether it be merchandise, jewelry, gold, or dope. 
you know, stake it out, wait till they leave, kick in the door and go get it. And he would do it. He had a little crew of guys that would do it. One of them was my my girlfriend at the time, her brother, crackhead brother. So these guys were freaking, they would do anything, bro. I would, I would, if I didn't like a guy that I was selling dope to, like weed to, I, I would get it to the point where I might say, sell him 20 pounds, and then call Ricky and his boys and say, listen, I just sold the guy 20 pounds, man, kick in the door and get it, and I'll split it with you, or whatever, you know, easily split it, or just give you cash. I'd be like, 20 pounds, I'll give you 7,000 in cash, and you guys each keep a pound. And they're like, hell yeah. And they go stake it out, and they wait for the guy to leave, and they go in there and get it. They climb through a freaking window, they kick in the door. That's how they, who they were, and I was, this is, so this is my crew of guys. I had this, like, crew of ruffians that I hung around with. And I liked him, and, his, and dude, he was fun to hang out with. He was a really funny guy. He worked out. He was good. But as soon as he stopped working out and stopped coming around as much, somebody told me that he was getting high. And I told him, bro, I had given him a, a cell phone. It was a burner phone. This is the one we use for business. And I said, uh, somebody told me he was getting high, and I didn't believe it but they swore up and down. They saw him getting high in cocaine and heroin. Like he went up on coke, came down to heroin throughout the night. So I say to Ricky, I call him, get him alone. I said, hey bro, I told you bro, as long as you're straight and narrow, bro, we'll always be boys and you know, but I can't trust no dope fiend, bro. So give me the phone. And he's like, what, are you serious, Al? Are you serious? I'm like, dead ass serious, bro. Give me the phone, you're out. I can't deal with no crackhead, bro. I can't deal with no dope fiend. Bro. And he says, why, what's up? I said. Here's what's gonna happen, bro. You're gonna end up getting busted. You're gonna get knocked. And you're gonna wanna be on the street because you wanna get high, because you're strung out. And the cops are gonna tell you like, we'll let you out, give us your plug, give up somebody, and you're gonna give me up. And then what am I gonna do, bro? Because you're gonna hide, so I gotta go after your kid, because he had a daughter. And uh, um, that, that his daughter actually committed suicide like a year ago, sad. I said, I got to go after you, your, your, your family, or whatever. I said, I don't want none of that to happen. So let's just, you know, end it right here, bro. Go your own way, get your shit together. When you get your shit right, come back, man. We can get back in the game. Until then, oh, I can't deal with no junkie and no dolphin, bro. It, it is what it is. It's too dangerous. I'm going to end up having to kill you. And I said, and he's like, you serious, bro? You serious? I said, yeah. So I took the phone, said, you know, God bless, go on your way. And he, like, he managed this. Cause at this time he had like a night, he had just bought like a convertible Mustang, got his own house and apartment. He was good, doing good. He had that good job, but you know, from afar, I watched him deteriorate over like six months until he was back in prison. You know, and that's how, that's how it always ends. You know, now had I kept dealing with him on, uh, you know, in the drug game and doing illegal stuff with him, it's a very high probability that he might have ratted me out. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe not. You just don't know. But it ain't worth it, man, to make a few thousand bucks a week or whatever with somebody. It ain't worth it. You just let him go, man. Cut him off. Anybody who's getting high, and including me. Like, when I was getting high, I never ratted on anybody, but I was reckless, and I was crazy, and I did stupid stuff. And I was certainly going to bring heat. I was certainly going to do dumb things that could uh, to get everybody in trouble. And so... There were guys who wanted nothing to do with me when I started. When I started getting high, my friend Mark and my friend Paulie and some of these guys that I dealt with, they were just like, you know, I was getting high. Somebody found out. You know, my friend Pat found out, and he told these guys, you know, be careful. Al's acting wild, man. He's doing crazy stuff, man. He's just you know, robbing banks and hijacking trucks and freaking jacking dope dealers. It's crazy. So now they're all like, freaking, he might jack me. You know what I'm saying? He order up 30, 50 pounds of weed. He's done it to other people. Why wouldn't he do it to me? So they cut me off the way they should have. And just like I cut off Ricky. But uh, I remember dude, at one point, though, and I'm, there's a whole other story to tell about Ricky down the road. And I'll, and I'll probably tell this part again. But my he, he runs into my girl. Once I'm in prison, right? He, he got out of prison and got back on his feet. He was doing good. I heard people telling me, oh, Ricky's out. He's doing good. You know, he's balling. He's moving dope. He's da da da. I'm like, good for him. Um, and he sees my girl in the club and he says, Yo, what's up with Al? You know, how how's Al doing? And she was really bitchy. And she wasn't the type of girl who was going to be bitchy. She wasn't that kind of girl cut, cut like that. She goes, really? How's he doing? You know how he's doing. He's in mother in prison. How about write him a letter? And she goes, oh, he says, oh, really? It's like that? And I guess she told me he had a friend with him. And he was kind of acting tough and, like, cool, trying to be cool. From He's like, yeah, yeah, but she, you know, I'll write him or whatever, send him some money and blah, 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 blah. And she's like, Ricky, you're acting all tough and cool in front of your boy. If Al was right here right now, you'd be terrified, my laugher, because he sent you money for four years straight. 
He answered your calls for four years straight. He supported you. When he got out of prison, he took you shopping, took you to club, got you a job, put you in a game, blah, blah, blah. You know, and here he has been in prison for four or five years now. I've been in prison for like four or five years. You ain't sent him a letter. And he's like, oh, man, you know, I'm, I'm busy. I have my own issues. And she's like, yeah, shut the frick up, man. My little girl, girlfriend, Ramona, she's like, you're a D-bag. And that's just laughing. So that was cool. She told me, she's like, I'm not usually a bitch. But to him, I was because I was just couldn't believe that after all you did for him, supporting him, he didn't need to support you at all. And, and then when he got out of prison recently, um, he was out. And I was trying to mentor him and trying to talk to him and talk some sense into him and tell him, like, you can do anything, bro. You can start a business and blah, 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 blah. But he was just went right back to hanging around the same scumbags, doing the same dumb stuff. And then he, he was wanted. He absconded from his parole officer. He didn't check in or drop a urine or whatever he was supposed to do. So I looked him up on Otis because I heard from him. I looked him on Otis and just absconded. He's wanted. So I messaged him. I said, what are you doing, bro? And I, I tell him, I talk him into turning himself in. I said, bro, just go turn yourself in and get it over with. You're going to have to go anyway. When they catch you, you're going. It's better if you volunteer. Then they'll be like, maybe go lenient and let you back out or give you a break. And he said to me, last thing I said to him, last thing I said to him, he said to me, it was like, I'm on my way there to check in now. But I know he's on drugs. You know, and he probably didn't want to withdraw. He just, you know, he's on dro drugs. He doesn't want to draw. doesn't want to go in. So he's, eventually, I'm sure he got caught. But then the last thing he said to me was, uh, all right, Al, enough, man. I heard enough. Because I was sitting there, like, busting his balls. Like, what are you doing, man? Get your shit together. Stop acting like a knucklehead, bro. You're too old for this, man. You spent your whole life in prison and blah, 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 blah. And he just said, all right, man, enough. And he blocked me. So that was what it is. But I'll tell some more stories about him. Right now, I'm going to eat. I'm out. Bye. Former prisoner and inmate. <laughs> he said, uh, what are you doing, guns? Ah! You bit the hell out of me. Wanna see you with your hands up? <laughs> <laughs> Going straight to the sky, let me see you put your hands up. Cause we do till we die and we on another level I'm at New York City Got a piece of the pie Told you once, told you twice That we only got one life On the way to achieve success after prison He's gonna share his story with us right now Diamond shine, best at night You wake yours, I'll wear mine Former prisoner and inmate. <laughs> he said, uh, what are you doing, guns? Ah! You bit the hell out of me. Wanna see you with your hands up? <laughs> Going straight to the sky, let me see you put your hands up. Cause we do till we die and we on another level. I'm at New York City. Got a piece of the pie. Told you once, told you twice that we only got one life. On the way to achieve success after prison, he's gonna share his story with us right now. Diamond shine, best at night. You wake yours, I'll wear mine.